We did this book. Yo, as you see in the building, let's get it. That was fire, man. <laughs> Look, man. Everybody that's in Israel to do music need to go ahead and just drop an album. It don't gotta be 15 songs, seven songs. Seven songs. Give us seven songs that we can go right on our Amazon app, iTunes app, boom, buy it, boom. We got now we got some good music that we can rock to and we can vibe to. Cause that was fire, man. The sister remind me of uh uh Rhapsody. Y'all know who that is, Raps. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Dope yeah. lyricist. Got a good flow, good rhythm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I was feeling that one, man. That was that was awesome. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, man. Yeah, man. Well, by, by the end of the show, man, me and the sister got a collab together. Fire joint. You know what I'm saying? This is what it's about, man. You know, supporting one another. You know what I mean? Like, Israel, man, it's real talent here, man. You know, music being cultivated, man, and, and brothers and sisters are taking it to another level. You know, I was blessed to be around when, you know, when it wasn't uh, as popular. Now it's like, you know what I'm saying, being taken to another level, man. So for all praise and glory to the most high for that. 
Yeah, man. All praises indeed. The, the sister, she she did her thing with that one production. Like this can rival uh, mainstream, bro. This can rival <laughs> what's in the mainstream. And, and that's why, you know, as a community, we should be pushing our artists. We should be listening to our artists and uh, sharing it and getting them out there because we going to get the machine. The machine going to push their artists. They're going to push Cardi B. They're going to push uh, 2 Chain. They're going to push whoever out there that's hot right now, Pooh Shiesty. They're going to push these people. So just right. like they got that mentality, the, the strip to say make your head hard against their they head, man. You know what I'm saying? So we got to we gotta match that intensity with our music. If we saying we Israel and we saying that we Jews, then why are we not having that same energy towards our artists and the people that's putting in for our nation? Yeah, man. That's why it's, it's the responsibility of the listeners as well, man. Brothers and sisters got to start sharing and pushing that, pushing the the music that that you know what I'm saying that they vibe to. You know, it ain't it ain't about no monopoly. On our end, man. Any any true music artist, man, that you support, man, you should be doing all you can to sound the trumpet, man, the best you can. That's the responsibility of the entire nation, man. That's a big fact, man. Speaking of responsibility, I want to say to the audience that's in here right now, hitting that like button don't cost you a dollar. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> hitting that like button is free 99. Right. Y'all playing, man. Stop playing. Hit that like button. Hit that notifi notification bell, too, so you can know every time we go live. Every time we go live, you should be hitting that notification bell so you can get that link to see when we go live. And you can you can be a part of this and uh, help us build and grow. Get our name out there. Every time you hit that like button, you're, going, you're helping towards our YouTube algorithm to get the videos uh, more exposure. You understand? Yeah. So if you enjoy the information, you want you want us to get bigger than what we are. You're going to have to contribute by pushing that like button, hitting that notification bell, family. Let's do it. Subscribe to the Source Debate League on YouTube and following our Facebook group, the Source Debate League on Facebook. So, you know what I'm saying? Show some love. Show some support. Support the music. Support the Israelites. If you want to see these people grow, you're going to have to support them. When they make their EPs, their LPs, you're going to have to go out and buy it, just like you went out and bought Pooh Shiesty's album, how you went out right, and bought right. Pooh album, and so on and so forth. When you when, 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 when spent your money on Megan Thee Stallion. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Something that's going to destroy the minds of your children, you understand? But you got your ch children in the front row jamming to it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The kids got a phone. They got an Amazon. They got an iTunes app. They buying all their singles. And right. You won't, you won't, you won't spend a cent. You won't send an Abraham Lincoln on 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 the Israelite song, man. Right. So we got to do better. We got to do better, man. Support your own, homegrown. Support yours, and you know what I'm saying. That's how we get big. That's how we grow by um, doing the Black Wall Street model. You know what I'm saying. Look at the, you examine Black Wall Street. How did they get big? Because they supported each other. And they made sure that dollar circulated. That's what okay. made it great. We got to practice that. And that's a biblical principle. Uh, Jeremiah, ain't that in Acts 4? You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that we we good before we start going out here and spending with other people. You know what I'm saying? We make sure that the, the home team is straight. Uh, but with, with no further ado, y'all know what it is. It's SUC, source up gang, source up click. You know what I'm saying? As you see, we're going to throw it in your face. As you see in the place. You know what I'm saying? We sourced up and sourced out. Know what I'm talking about? <laughs> right. Gang, seven gang, seven candlesticks up. Been telling y'all, it ain't the bait to stick up. So tonight, as y'all can see in the title, Black Jews in Africa and the Americas by Two to Parfit Part Two. We really read over here, Jeremiah. We really yeah, read right. over here. You know what I'm saying? Garfield got exposed this week. You know, to go check that out. Garfield gets smoked by Tudor Parfit. He got exposed. You know why he got exposed? Because he does not read the literature. He does not read sources. He don't. It's clear. We've been telling him that uh, there were Jews in West Africa, many Jewish communities in West Africa. We've been telling them some of them Jews got, got uh, swiped up in the transatlantic slave trade. We've been telling him that. Then you get Tudor Parfit on there. 
and, and sit up here and say the same thing, and now he got egg on his face. So you guys don't have to worry about the source because the source is always going to live up to the name, the source. <laughs> That's that. It's the source up. Go ahead, brother. My bad. Yeah, man, talk to him, man. I mean, look, man, at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> they're working diligently, man, to try to, you know, the brother had said something, man. He was like, yeah, man, I'm not saying that. Uh, he said that uh, uh, all I'm saying is just because I'm from the Caribbeans don't make me an Israelite. You damn right, brother. We ain't sitting out here saying <laughs> brother, it's totally fine for you to be the, from the Caribbean and not be an Israelite. You know, I just want to make that clear to everybody, man. Like, again, man, as I said before, man, we got to get out of this spirit of speaking in absolutes, man. You know, uh, but there got to be a reason that uh, this movement is, is rising and has rise to a degree. Now, Joshua, I, I heard some new information that the Israelite community is bigger than the conscious community. That's a fact. You know? That's I, a I mean, you know, so th this is some this is something new to me. So I'm I'm a uh, you know I'm thankful to the Most High for the movement, man. Right, right. It, it, you know, the book we covering together is um, Edith, Edith Bruder's book on the Black Jews of Africa. She talks about how huge this community is. Bruce D. Haynes, another PhD, talks about how huge the Israelite community is. We 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 span other countries. We're in Africa. We got people that's in, in, in Mozambique. We got people in the Caribbean. We got people in South America. 200,000 people claiming to be Israelites, man, in South America, in Brazil. See, people look at this YouTube and they think YouTube is a reflection of reality. No, it's not. There ain't no Sonetta TV in, in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> right. But there's Igbo Israelites in Africa, right? Uh, Rabbi Fouye, I was watching his interview the other day on, on the Kaluno Inc. Maybe we'll touch on that on the channel. He was talking about he had over, he was over a, a congregation with a quarter million Nigerians, man. Damn. Quarter million. Damn. And that was 20 years ago. So think about where it's at now. The Israelite community is big. And that's why I was telling Gar when Garfield said, well, they, the Israelites don't like me because uh, I'm stopping them from blowing up. We already blew up. What did you talk? We've been blowing up. <laughs> playing with me. Rabbi Matthew and Rabbi Ford, we've been blowing up. We've been hot since Cherry, man. That's right. 1900s. Cherry, when he got the, the truth and the understanding on who we are, he went to Africa. He went to different places and spread the gospel and got more people involved. So we've been doing this for hundreds of years just because people suppress it. Don't talk about it. Don't mean it's not going on. You see what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. yeah, man, we, we way bigger than them, them cats. Them cats is a microcosm compared to what, what we are. You right. feel me? All right, man. Shout out to the Orthodox Moore in the building. He says, source up or shut up. That's right, man. Source up or shut up. All right, let's get it. Let's get let's get right into the meat and potatoes. You know how we do. We actually read over here. <laughs> we actually read over here, man. Why the competition don't read like we do? Matter of fact, matter of fact, let me go ahead and open up for for my dagger squad. You know, uh, viewers, my team Osiris viewers. So we do something your channel don't do. <laughs> Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high. Take a look, it's in a book, a reading rainbow. I can go anywhere. Friends to know and ways to grow, a reading rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we taking you guys through the reading rainbow today, man. These other cats do not read. It's, it shows. Garfield, you can't read. But it's cool. It's cool. That's what we're here for. We're here to fill in that void and fill in that gap. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you know what's crazy to me, Jeremiah? A brother told me that the Israelites need to leave the conscious community. We want you out of the conscious community. We never accepted the invite. 
All right, why right. are you guys pretending like we a part of y'all click? We not a part of y'all. We got our own thing going. Oh, are you saying you're not conscious? No, I'm not. I'm saying I'm not associated with this thing you call the conscious community. Right. <laughs> right. Talk to these niggas, man. <laughs> <laughs> man, we we Israel and that's it, man. Nation, we we repping the nation. You know what I'm saying? Y'all either going to get down or lay down. That's it. All right, but anyway, with no further ado, we got the book here, Black Jews in Africa and the Americas, as promised, to the perfect. We're going to be dealing with chapter two tonight. And after you uh, finish this series, it's going to be as if you read the book yourself. And anybody that wants to, you know, reference the book or reference um, the topic, they can always come to our channel and watch the breakdown. And before we get started, how could I forget this, Jeremiah? How could I forget this? I want you guys to know, I want all our viewers to know that we have we are being attacked. Every video since we addressed Team Osiris has been copyright claim, copyright claim, copyright claim. We have been attacked on every video. So what we're going to do from now on, let me, um, well, we already been doing, we had this in practice, but we're going to make sure every time before I read or going into any source material, we're going to deal with the fair use law um, because we have a lot of enemies and they would like to see this channel be destroyed. So they're going to make these false copyright claims. But we're well within our right to review, comment, add criticism, report, um, do anything for scholarship and research is what we're doing tonight. right? And we will be adding commentary as, as we go along. That's in the Fair Use Act, right? So it says, under the Copyright Act, the fair use of copyrighted material without permission is allowed when used for the following purposes. Criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including making copies for use in the classroom, scholarship and research, and parody. So we're well within the right. We're not selling this man's material. We're not claiming that this material is our ours. We're just adding commentary, reviewing the information, and teaching and researching. That's all we're doing here. So I just want to make that clear because we've been constantly attacked ever since we brought up those erroneous claims by Team Osiris. And we got an idea on who's doing it. You understand? Uh, we have a great idea on who's doing it. Because out of nowhere, Jeremiah, we start getting copyright claims as soon as we address these cats. The, the first video that gets the copyright claim is the video dealing with them. And hey, let me ask you this, man. If, does somebody has to make a claim in order for a claim to be made? That's a fact. That's a fact. <laughs> That's a fact. Somebody has to make the claim. And it just so happened to be the video that you're talked about in and you're involved in. Yeah, it's somebody from your camp. Somebody from Team Osiris. And I think we all know who, who uh, who's doing it because Chris, I'm just going to say your name. I'm not going to, you know what I'm saying, beat around the bush here. You did this to Judah Nazareth and got his channel took now. You kept flagging his videos. This is what you do. This is what you do. You're known for this. You're reputed for this. But guess what? You're not stopping anything over here because all of your claims are fallacious. We read the Fair Use Act every show. We read the Fair Use Act every show. Facts. So, again, we're well within our right. All right. I just had to put that disclaimer out there, family. We're going to get right to the book, as you can see in your stream. Chapter 2. Lost tribes of Israel and Africa. If you just tuned in, this is the Black Jews in Africa and the Americas by Tudor Parfit. And it, it reads: In medieval times and earlier, there was the widespread notion of that somewhere in Africa, as well as elsewhere in the world, Jewish kingdoms and mountaintop cities, people by certain of the lost tribes, were to be found somewhere beyond the fabulous river Sambat Yon. The Sambat Yon spewed stones rather than water and did not flow on the Sabbath day. No one could cross the Samayaton uh, during the week because of the stones. And on the Sabbath, the pious lost tribes would not traverse it because the, prohi the, uh, prohibition, the prohibition of traveling on the Sabbath. The myths and legends associated uh, Sambayaton and the lost tribes with the African interior 
were responsible to some degree for the development of the imagined communities of black Jews throughout Africa. So a lot of people will look at this work and be like, well, he's using the words myth, legends, and imagine. Like, well, he's just discounting it. Actually, he's not, but he's being what we call objective and he's being fair with the information, right? Because a lot of it is just legend and myth. And I just got a new book about how majority of African history is legend and myth. Majority of African history is oral history. If I could pull this book up real quick, um, not wasting too much time. Let me get it, get it out of the box here. I was just reading it the other day when it came in the mail. This is the uh, Orthodox Encyclopedia of African Historiography, Methods and Sources. I just got this book, so I'm not going to put it on the screen. I haven't typed it in and like that. I don't have a digital copy. But within this book, it talks about um, right here in the introduction, the, in the absence of the usual documentary history, historical sources, African historians have developed a wide variety of alternative methods and sources to reconstruct African past, such that the anthropologist Wyatt McGaffey characterized African history as a decathlon of social sciences. Archaeology, historical linguistics, ethnography, and oral traditions have all been widely utilized over the past 50 years. So again, when you're dealing with African history, majority of it is not written. So they have to use these different methods to construct Africans' past. And one of the methods they use, the historiographers use, is oral history. All right? So I don't want to hear nobody saying, well, it's just oral history. Well, if you're going to throw away oral history, you're going to throw away majority of Africa's past, which would be what? Nonsensical, irrational. All right. So let's get back into it. It says, for Jews and Christians, the continued existence of the lost tribes of Israel was axiomatic. The lost tribes were viewed as the descendants of the 12 sons of Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, and Joseph. However, the tribe of Levi was scattered among the other tribes where its members served as a hereditary priesthood. The remaining 11 tribes were restructured into 12 secular groups, the number 12 having sacred properties, perhaps corresponding to the 12 months of the year. To achieve this, the tribe of Joseph was subdivided into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. The unity of the 12 tribes was short-lived, and soon they were split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the kingdom of Israel, which consisted of 10 of the tribes and the son, or one southern kingdom, Judah, which included Judah, Simeon, and most of ben Benjamin. As a result of the invasion of the Assyrian kings, Tiglath, Pelazer III, 732 BCE, and Sargon, 721 BCE, the kingdom of Israel was defeated, and the northern tribe, tribes were exiled in two stages, chiefly to Assyria, Media, and the lands of the neighboring um, Aram Naharaim. The elements of the ten tribes exiled to Assyria may be presumed to have been absorbed into the Assyrian population as had many others who fell prey to the Assyrian policy of forced Assyrianization and ethnic cleansing. There is some Assyriological evidence that individuals with Hebrew names were still found in the Assyrian army units in the 7th century BCE, but there is no other clear evidence of the continued existence of the exiles. So I want I would like to add commentary here because we read this also in Eda Bruder's work where she brought up the archaeology showing that Israel did indeed get uh, exile, and we do have um, evidence of that, of their names showing up in the Assyrian armies. Why is that important? I'm going to tell you why that's important. That gives credence to the historical narrative of the Bible, because we got a lot of people on YouTube and on social media doubting the existence of the Bible, the, the uh, historicity of the Bible, but well, we have numerous um, archaeological and anthropological evidences that point to a historical truth, man. And it shows the historicity of the Bible. We know the Assyrian siege happened. We know it happened because we have archaeology to back it up. You have the uh, Black Obelisk showing that these kings actually infiltrated and took people 
out of the land of Israel. So anybody doubting the historicity of the Bible at this point, you're scenic. You're scenic. You can't even say you're skeptical at this point. You're just a scenic. And scenics, that's what they do. They just say everything's fake, everything's false. No matter how much evidence, no matter how much proof, it's just fake and it's false because you guys are pushing an agenda. All right, so we're going to read on. It says, this is the point. Yeah, hold up real quick, man. I don't see how you are able to uh, have a conversation with this guy and create a narrative when his whole career is based on proving black Jews exist in Africa. Right. <laughs> When your whole narrative is that mm -hmm. uh, Judaism is fake when it comes to black people, anybody that's black is a convert. This is a, exactly contrary to that, bro. Not only is it showing, it's identifying the color spectrum, but it's also giving you a migration pattern that you can clearly follow. Right. Uh, yep. Right, right. That's a fact. And um, at this point, it's like you guys are just being scenics. <laughs> it don't matter how much evidence is put in your face. And this is why I always tell people, I'm not here to convince anyone. I'm giving the information to those that want to hear. You understand? That's what that's what scriptures say, whether they hear or forbear. You know what I'm saying? I'm here for those that want to hear. I'm not trying to convince you of nothing. But those that want to study this information, that want to gain more knowledge in the field or in, in the category, I'm here for you. I'm here for your support. I'm here for your benefit. I'm not here to make these guys, these hard-headed guys, see truth. They see it. They don't care about truth. It's not about truth. It's about pushing an agenda like we've been saying. All right, so we're going to read on. It says, this is the point at which the history of the lost tribes of Israel stops and the history of the myth of the, of the, the lost tribes starts. A lot of people look, oh, he's using the word myth. Again, this is dealing with oral testimony as well, legends as well, myths as well, right? Now, I'm going to go back to this book about um, the Oxford Encyclopedia of African Historiography, Methods and Sources. I'm sorry, it's not on screen. I actually have the physical book in my hand. And <clears throat> this is the portion about early African past sources, interpretations, and meanings. Page number seven. It says, to write about periods and places beyond literacy, that is, without fine grain calendar dates and named individuals, historians developed a conventional base of sources. Pa pale paleoecology, historical linguistics, archaeology, and anthropological genetics helped most with the periods before the 10th century. That's, that means... Before the 10th century CE, these guys are having to implement these methods to re, uh, reconstituate or rebuild Africans, Africa's past. It says oral traditions, a great variety of representational, representational and functional objects, ethnographic descriptions, and other documents help most with the following centuries. So again, they do not discount oral traditions which would fall into the myth and legend category. They use that to reconstruct Africa's past. Just want to keep that in your in your memory banks. And then if we go, let me see if I have my Eater Bruder PowerPoint up. A student, uh, Mr. Parfit, Dr. Parfit, a student of Dr. Parfit, we've been covering her book. She says clearly, it's plain. It's plain today what, 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 what uh, she says about the usage of the word myth and how they use the term myth. Again, page number 98 in the Black Jews of Africa, it says- Right, right, right. These things are rooted, these things are rooted in something tangible. Go ahead, Ox, like it. Facts, facts. So, that and then that's exactly what they mean. It's something <laughs> behind it. It's not saying pure fiction. It says it right here in page 98 of Eda Bruder's book, following Mercea Ilati. I'm using the concept of myth, which reveals a living pattern rather than a pure fiction as a sacred history and therefore a true history because it always refers to reality and at the same time reveals the eruption of the sacred into the world. So again, 
that these people are not discounting something just because it's regarded as a myth. And then if you go to the introduction to Eater Bruder's book, it says she quotes Sigmund Freud, a Freud, however you say it, it's French, right? Page number three, it says, but with this contempt, one will commit unfairness similar to the thoughtless rejection of material legends, traditions, interpretations of people's prehistory. They call this a thoughtless rejection. Why? Because it reads on, it says, despite all the distortions and misunderstandings, it is through them that the reality of the past is represented. Right. Come on, man. Exactly, bro. Exactly. So basically, when you're you're talking about they're giving legitimacy to uh, what people say about themselves. You have to take that into account, and then you collect that with things that are saying said about them by other people. This is all a part of the research uh, a method, right? And then you compare these things. It's a method behind all this, family. It's not just one way of doing things. Oh, I'm just going to take the myth. Oh, I'm just going to take what others say about them. You have to compile all these informations and compare, right? So you can come to a, a, a more concise uh, a, a resolution when it comes to the identi uh, identity of these people. That's a fact, man. Right, right. It's like the core element of the story is still going to be true. Like we just read about the somebody, the somebody on. Let's say that's all fictional. The somebody on the rivers of stones that spit out stones. Let's say it's all fictional. What about the migration of the people? Did a migration happen? And to the perfect covers that in this book, a migration of people we call Jews or Israelites did indeed happen in times past. We read that the other day. Let me get it. Oh, let me get it. Let me get it. Let me get it. Get out of this. We read that the other day. I'm going to keep reading this. And Sarah Taib, uh, Carlene's book, In the Jews of North Africa. All right. So we can clearly see a migration of Jews penetrated into Africa in early times. All right. And I always go to the point of pre Islamic period right here. It says the Jews. Under the Carthage and Phoenicians, it's page number 16, from 813 to 146 BCE. This is how far this history stretches back. The Jews are described as being native to North Africa and almost as part of its flora and fauna. Flora meaning, you know, flowers, plants, fauna meaning animals, right? Ever since historians and archaeologists started to write on this region, with regards to the foundation of Carthage in 813 BCE by Dido. And we know Dido is related to Ahab and, and um, Jezebel, man. Right? So it says, uh, Dido, the queen of the Phoenicians. However, it is also possible that these Jews had settled in North Africa prior to this date. As we know, King Solomon, who reigned from 973 to 936 BCE, had an excellent economic relations with King of Tyre, Hiram, who reigned from 969 to 935 BCE. Indeed, one can read in the Bible, right? And we already know the passage in question. So they're saying that this history goes all the way back to this period, the 10th century BCE. We had North African Jews, Jews coming into Africa, trading and traveling. So a migration did happen. You did have a movement of people from the Levant, from that from that area, from that locality into Africa. That's not even disputed. You can't even dispute that anymore. That's nothing you can. Hey, what my brother say, you Negroes can't refute that. <laughs> All right. So let's get to um, the Pax Romana. I always bring this up. Facts, facts, facts. <laughs> talk to him, man. Talk to talk talk to him, man. <laughs> According to Saint Jerome, under the Pax Romana, the Jewish communities underwent a period of great prosperity, all the way from India to the western tip of Africa. No, no, no. They gotta say only to Ethiopia, the western tip of Africa. Right. <laughs> 
So we we've been in these lands. We've been accustomed. We we know the Saharan route. That's how we were able to. And we're going to cover that in the next chapter of Eater Brutus book. So y'all tune in for that as well. We were able to draw maps that were accurate of West Africa. We're the first ones to do it. Jews are because we are you with the landscape. Look at the Catlin Atlas. That that depicts the Sahara, the Sahel, which is below the Sahara in parts of Western Africa underneath the, the Sahel. Because we know those routes, we know those places. We've been there for thousands of years. That's the only explanation for that. All right. So again, right here it says this chain of events, talking about Titus and the sacking of Jerusalem. This chain of events occurred once again following Bar Koba's insurrection from 132 to 135. And we know Hadrian, the Roman emperor, made it illegal for us to even claim that we're Jews. We got expelled then, and that's when Palest that's when uh Judea got renamed to Palestine. You understand? And during this during this uh, epoch of time, the failure of his revolt led directly to the expulsion of the Jews of Israel, who had also been enslaved and redeemed by their North African brethren. So again, you know, we have to take that in consideration too, right? Like when we're going into certain parts of Africa and you're seeing uh people with different names with Hebrew Israelite practices. These people were hunted severely. They, and it's like they don't take that in consideration. You know, um, every other uh, tribe or, or, or groups of people were able to enter into certain agreements with the Romans, man. Right? They was it were able to enter into certain agreements when they when it was told to them that we're, we're not looking for you, we're looking for these other guys, right? And so now you start to see uh, less of less connections as far as people identifying themselves purposely, make trying attempting to make a separation with Israel based upon these people hunting them. Right? I yep. Facts. Big facts. So what they can't say, Jeremiah, is the Jews had nothing to do with Africa, have nothing to do with West Africa. Um, we have an abundance of proof to show that this migration did occur in times past. And there's nothing you guys can do about it. You either take the truth or you don't. You know what I'm saying? All right. So back to the book. Page number 21 is where we left off. It says, this is the moment. The 10 tribes dis disappeared from normal history and became an imagined mythical community. The 10 tribes as an imagined community assumed great importance in the prophecies. For instance, in Ezekiel 37, 16, where the final redemption of Israel was linked to the reunion of the lost tribes with the descendants of the southern kingdom. And this explains why it is a fundamentalist Christian. It is that fundamentalist Christians have such a keen interest in groups throughout the world who claim to be descended from the lost tribes. The Apocrypha carried on the story of the lost tribes, revealing the subsequent to their de deportation, to their deportation, the tribes formed this plan for themselves and that they would leave the multitude of the nations and go to a more distant region where mankind had never lived, that there at least they that there at least they might keep their stat statues which they had not kept in their own land and if you guys are familiar with that that's second Ezra chapter 13 40 through 48 is where he's getting that from right it is from the text such as these that the whole edifice of la later lost tribes mythology was constructed one of the features that become axiomatic in the myth of the lost tribes, as we have seen, is their presence beyond the river that by the time of Josephus was called the Sabbatical River and later text the Sambat Yom, or some similar versions of the name implying a relationship with the word Sabbath. In each case, this river observes the rules ordained for the Sabbath, which is, which is to say that on the Sabbath, it stops flowing. Cer certainly, certainty about the existence of the lost tribes passed effortlessly into the Christian canon. In the book of Revelation, we read, and there were there were sealed 144,000 of all tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000, and of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000, and so on. For Christians, there were two broad categories of Jews. 
who played an important role in the Christian imagination. From the first Christian centuries, the view was expressed that somewhere in the world, there were warriors descended from the lost tribes who were biding their time, but who would rally to Christ upon his return and help him rout the forces of evil. The Jews were less obsessed by imagining Jews than were Christians, but there was some debate among Jews to as to where the lost tribes were and if they really existed. There is, for instance, a passage in the Jerusalem Talmud that puts some long enduring flesh on the bones of the myth. We hear that the 10 tribes were carried away to three distinct places, to the other side of the Sambat Yon River, to Daphne, and to the place where they, where they were covered by the cloud which descended upon them and where they will eventually be redeemed. According to other versions, the tribes in the third locus, locus just means location, right? The third locus were supposed to have been covered not by a cloud, but exiled inside the dark mountains. And it's interesting they brought this up. Oh, it's going to say it. It said, this is the sense in the second century rabbinic historical work, Seder Olam Rabbah. These dark mountains were taken to represent Africa which according to the Talmud, Alexander the Great had to tra traverse to get to Carthage. So what he's bringing out is it was in the religious discourse, Talmud, Christian writings, Mishnah, about these lost tribes. And one of the places that they put the lost tribes or put these tribes are, uh, is in Africa, beyond these quote unquote dark mountains, right? Another of the starting points for the Jews in Africa myths was the 9th century Sefer Eldad, written by one Eldad Hadanai, Eldad the Danite. Eldad is known to have visited Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Yemen, and most famously, the important community of Karun in present-day Tunisia. Here he made some noteworthy claims that he was a Hebrew-speaking member of the tribe of Dan, which he said was still flourishing in Havilah and Cush taken to be Ethiopia, along with Nephtali, Gad, and Asher. The four tribes fought continuous wars against seven kingdoms with seven languages. In addition, he gave information about the children of Moses who were incarcerated beyond the river of Sambat Yon. The four tribes on the far side of the Sambat Yon could not speak to the tribes on the near side, as the river was too wide, and the noise it made too great. They communicated by a carrier pigeon. Eldad, you want to say something? Out? No, no, no. I'm listening, man. Go ahead. Eldad, yeah, I, I, I thought I might have chimed in. You all right, brother? <laughs> yeah, I'm good, good. Eldad, Eldad, Eldad painted a utopian picture of the life of the lost tribes. Children in the distant land never died in lifetime of their parents. The Talmud there was written in the purest Hebrew. They were warlike Spartan in their daily habits and exceedingly prosperous. What, what, what I find intriguing about um what Eldad was writing is that you read about like the limba and they talk about this warrior history or you read about even the bond to expansion and we know that we our ancestors went through Africa and dominated it because of their <coughs> ability to use iron metallurgy and iron tools and they made like people like the um the forest people or bushmen subservient to them and they took over them and started replacing a lot of those males with A and B haplotypes during this period. I feel as if this history that Al Dad was presenting is analogous or similar to what we call the bond to expansion, and that's why I put those two in the same pocket. But that's for another one. I did a I did a whole presentation on the source about the bond to expansion, so you guys can check that out, and see it, see uh, where I went. In that actual breakdown. So, 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 so these uh these connections are based upon um uh certain um abilities that these people were able to execute in, in their areas and regions. Right, in right. Regards what, to uh the, tut the tutelage that they was using, like tools and and certain methods that they were utilizing. That yeah, that's how I analyze the information that um. For these people to come in Africa and be warlike and, and pretty much if we look at the bond to expansion, they dominated because those tribes in sub-Saharan Africa were still using stone tools and we was using iron. So iron, one of the strongest metals, we're able to deforest, 
faster. We were able to, and we had farming, so we didn't have to worry about hunting and gathering. We had we had uh, a surplus of food, so our population outgrew theirs. There's so many reasons that, that went into that, and I feel like this story is analogous to that, meaning similar to, and I put those two in the same box because of that. You know what I'm saying? So I believe that's the historical reality that's being reflected in yeah. what they call yeah, myth. Yeah, man, I mean, like in layman terms, man, the difference is, is yeah, yeah, the difference is, is, um, you know, them being able to utilize stone on the end of arrows, like the brother said, drop down trees, you understand that the, 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 the uh, um, you know, in comparison to others using stones, right? Stones break, you know what I mean? You use a stone to try to chop a tree. You might go through so many amounts of uh, uh, stone, you'll probably be able to get it done, but not as quickly, right? These things matter when it comes to building civilizations and just uh, campsites and 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 in certain um, city city off walled off regions, man. This is what the brother is talking about when he's talking about metallurgy, right? Uh, these being able to upgrade their tools to be more efficient and quicker with the development of society. Are you? Man, that's a fact. And that's, and that's how the Bantus were able to dominate Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's why today, people with e-markers have the lion's share in Africa. Majority of the people there have e-markers because of what we call the Bantu expansion. It wasn't always like that. All right, so back to the reading. We're on page 23. We read the Talmud. There were there were uh, there was written in the purest Hebrew that they were warlike Spartan in their daily habits and exceedingly prosperous. We may be quite sure that Eldad of the tribe of Dan was not as claimed a member of the tribe of Dan. And we may be fairly sure sure that his name was not Eldad if we take the corpus of text associated with him more or less at face value. It may be possible to deduce, and a number of modern scholar, scholars have done so, that Eldad was a Jew from either the other Eastern Islamic world or very much less plausible, plausibly from Ethiopia. So, again, like I said, he's open to the information. He's being objective. He's giving all explanations to who Eldad could be. People will read this book and be like, okay, well, he's, he's denying it. Nah, I mean, he's, he's saying it's plausible. He's not saying, well, I know for 100% fact that this is not true. No, he's saying it's plausible. And that's what scholars do. This is how you get a PhD. You got to be honest. All right. He says, what we know about him is that he had a series of adventures, which included being captured by cannibals. He knew something about Jewish law and literature. And he arrived to uh, Caron in 883 before continuing on to Spain, at which point he dis disappeared from view. Some scholars in the 12th century have seen Sefer Eldad, the first reference to the Falashas or Beta Israel, Ethiopia. But St Steph, uh, Stephen Kaplan cast grave doubt on it. Ullendorf in Beckenham has suggested that there may be an Arabic substratum to his Hebrew suggesting some sort of Arab Arabian origin. What we do know is that Eldad existed and made the claims outlined above. It could well be that his purpose, if he had a greater purpose, but storytellers often do not, was raised to raise the spirits of the Jews by giving them news of the tribes of Israel who lived in freedom. The reports of the existence of such Jewish kingdoms undoubtedly encouraged and comforted Eldad's hearers by contradicting the Christian contention that Jewish independence had ceased forever with the destruction of the Second Temple. One way or another, Eldad's work was to have an enduring influence on the Jewish and Europe European imaginaire. According to some scholars, Eldad tale gave rise to the legend of Prester John, although there's also the possibility that while the Prester John letters are most almost three centuries later than Eldad, some of the literary material associated with Eldad is much later than has been thought and that it reflects the Prester John material, not the reverse. Even if this is true, it does look as if the elements of Eldad's story may have been woven into various versions, Latin, Hebrew, and provincial Provencal of the Prester John letters. In time, Eldad's Hebrew account, Sefer, 
Eldad, which was first printed on Mantua in 1480 and was to be translated into a number of languages, including German, Latin, and Arabic, had a considerable impact upon the way Africa was viewed in Europe and made a great contribution to the notion that Jews inhabited the African interior. Such a notion was not necessarily viewed with favor by Jews. The polemical work written by the prolific Mig Miguel de Barrios from 1625-1701 on the history of the Sephardic community of Amsterdam went to some pains to dissociate the history of the Jews from the history of the Black Africans. The background to this is the profusion of texts that suggested certain Africans had Jewish ancestry. So that's huge. De Barrios contradicted, for instance, the Jesuit Antonio Posavino, 1533-1611, who had cited Preston John as a source for the fact that Ethiopians were descended from King Solomon and their arist aristocracy descended from Abraham. This information was available anyway since the Spanish translations of the parts of the Ethiopian royal chronicles, the Kibra Nagas, which appeared in the Historia de las Cosas de Ethiopia, Antwerp 1557, with a French translation the following year had traced back the royal line to the union of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba and their son, Ethiopia's first emperor, Menelik I. We dealt with this same topic in Eda Bruder's book. A lot of the things that he talking about, Eda Bruder covers as well. We talked about the Kibra Nagas. I personally cast doubt on it. Or doubt, I'm doubtful of that. I just believe that Jews eventually migrated into Ethiopia. We have plenty of evidence of that. The elephant time papyri, we had Jews in Aswan, so on and so forth. Jews in Egypt going into these areas. I believe these people descend from those from those ancestors. All right, so continue to read on page 25. Hold on one second, real quick. Um yeah, you had read something that was very powerful because according to um the naysayers, right? Um, the only reason, family, the only reason that we have any um, resemblance of Judaism in Africa from black Africans is because of conversion. I need you to go up a couple of lines where you said they're, they're Jew by the, uh, descent or their ancestry. Yeah, right here. I need you to go, that to go over people's heads. This is very important, family. Again. We are not speaking in the realms of absolute. We're not saying everybody in Africa is a Jew, right? This is what we're saying. Go ahead and read that. I, the uh, background is the profusion of texts that suggested that certain Africans had Jewish ancestry. There you go. Certain Africans had Jewish ancestry. Certain Africans. Now, what Africans, family? And how are they identify? I'm, I need to make sure that you all are paying attention, right, to the information that's being brought out, so you will be more, so you will be uh, better equipped to defend yourself in these type of conversations. Again, we have to move away from absolutes, and we have to start dealing with the information as such, right? We can't make the claim that every single slave that got on a slave ship was an Israelite, can't make that claim anymore, right? What we can do is say and prove that among the slaves were absolutely people that were descended from Israelites. That's what we can say, and that's what we're proving right now. I wanna make that clear to everyone, man. Right, we have to have growth in our verbiage. That's a fact, that's a whole fact. And I want to land me back off of that, that last statement you made that some of the Jews, um, <clears throat> that got off slave ships. I mean, some of the some of the uh, Africans that got off slave ships were Jews. And you know who said that a hundred years ago? I believe you got the book, Blair Niles. And I'm trying to get the quote right here, y'all can see. Blair Niles noted that in her book, Black Haiti, almost 100 years ago. Let me see if I can find it. I know it's in here. She basically said the Jews of Haiti were, um, were said to be Jews mixed with Negroes. Let me get that. 
pardon me, y'all. I've been a while since I looked at this. I, I released this uh, presentation as well, the Black Jews 2021 edition. You can check that out on the channel as well. Um, that was that was that came out on the six. So yeah, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and we're gonna continue to feed y'all with great content, book highlights, book reviews, overviews. We doing it all here. We working at the source. So um, let me get that blur. I really want to show this blur now to 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 back up what the brother just said. Um. Uh, it might be it towards the end, but in the book of Blair now, she basically talks about the 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 uh, slaves of Haiti. Ah, right here, right here. Blair now's page number one thirteen. It says the slaves imported from Africa had come from the Gold Coast, the Ivory Coast, the coast of Angola, and the Slave Coast, all the way from the Gulf of Guinea to the Cape of Good Hope. Now, we know the Gulf of Guinea was inundated with these, what we call, Luso-Africans. And many of these Luso-Africans were themselves Jews. They say they represented most of the tribes of that dark and mysterious continent. Some were said to be descendants of Jews mixed with Negroes. So what the brother just said was accounted for almost 100 years ago. When was Black Haiti released? Let's get it. I think 1936 or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it out, Ah. Wait, 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 uh, Blair Niles, Black Haiti. I was introduced to the, to the book by um, Joseph Williams, who wrote The Hebrewism of West Africa. He cited it, and I, I found the book. When was this book released? I, I know it had to be 1936. 1932. 1932. So almost a hundred years ago, this was attested to in her book. So uh, let's get back to the book. Uh, the book Black Haiti? The book Black Haiti, page number 113. All praise and glory. I got the book right here, man. One page what? Page number 113, it would talk about some of the slaves were said to be descended of Jews and Af uh, mixed with Negroes. Page 113. I just read it to the people. I have it right yeah, here. Yeah, it says, uh, yeah, it says uh, some some were said to be the descendants of Jews mixed with Negroes. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, like this is what why Garfield got embarrassed on his channel. This stuff has been out there forever. J. A. Rogers, Blair Niles, Joseph Williams. Uh, we could just go go down a list and keep going and keep going. This has been attested to. No, I mean, no, no, I didn't come into play until until the 1960s with uh, one way. <laughs> it, it didn't come into play. So something else. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's why um, it was stated in the Eater Brutus book that these people have been these black Jews in America have been going strong for at least 150 years. She said over 150 years. But we can we can ascertain that 150 years we've been going strong uh, at identifying ourselves as Israelites and bringing these different proof texts to back that up. All right. So let's get back to where we were. We, we left off on page number 25, right at the green highlighted portion up top. Um, Bernardo Jose Aldrete from 1565 to 1645. A cleric in Cordoba had also argued that Ethiopians were of Jewish blood, as Jews had long before been exiled to Ethiopia. It could be that some of these ideas about <coughs> African and Jew, and I listen to this part right here. It could be that some of these ideas about African and Jewish others could be traced back to ancient writers such as Sup Supsius Severus. Now we know who the Severian family is. The Severian family is, is famous for what? In 191 AD, taking down the Roman Empire and starting the Severian dynasty. You understand? So I wonder if this Severius is of that, of that dynasty. Because under that dynasty, the Jews were prosperous. Why? Because Septimius Severus himself was a Punic. All right? He, 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 was, he would be considered a Semite. You understand? And he was pretty favorable to the Jews of that time. 
and they were very prosperous during his era. I think I have a source on that. I think this same source here. Let me see if I can get it. Ah, right here. Page number 19 and 20. This is the Jews of North Africa from Dido to Gaul, right? By Sarah Taib Carlin. Page number 19 says, Marcel Simon notes, however, that later on, the Severus Roman dynasty, 193 to 235, a dynasty of African origins and of Semitic culture was openly philo-Semitic. Under the Severi, the Jews underwent a period of prosperity during which they were able to spread their beliefs throughout the Roman Empire without any restrictions, and especially among the Berbers. You see that? So now back to, to the Parfit's work. Again, yeah, hold on. Have, before we go back, I want to I want to read a little bit from this Black Haiti. Let's right? go. Let's get uh, it. Huh? I said, let's get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, well, this one thirteen. It says the slaves imported from Africa had come from the Gold Coast, the Ivory Coast, and the coast of Angola, and the slave coast, all the way from the Gulf of Ghana to the Kappa of Good Hope, to the Cape of Good Hope, so like it. They represented most of the tribes of that dark and mystery, uh, mysterious continent. Some were said to have the being descendant of Jews mixed with Negroes. These were tall, well-built men whose features had a Caucasian cast and whose language was clearly Semitic. Clearly Semitic, mm. right? So it's telling you uh, um, these regions, it's telling you the Gold Coast region, the Ivory Coast, and the coast of Angola, people that came in, and, and some of them were descended of Jews. Thanks. We have to take that into consideration, family, real talk. Right, right. You know, and then that's just historical, man. A lot of people getting mad at history. This is just what happened in history. <laughs> <laughs> Great information. Great add-on, brother. All right, so let's get back into the page. It was page 24 and 25. It said it could be that some of these ideas about African and Jewish others could be traced back to ancient writers such as Sapicius Severus. 360C to 425, who maintained that all sorts of people from Ethiopians to Indians, in fact, descended from the Jews. Perhaps the most important medieval work for the study of the European perceptions of the other in the late medieval period and for several hundred years was the travel of Sir John Mandeville. Before we read that, we just got to understand that back in the fourth century CE or the common era, you had this this historian or this writer saying that these Jews were in Ethiopia and also in India when we deal with the coaching Jews and stuff like that, right? So we still have historical attestation going back into ancient times telling you, hey, these people Jews, we got Jews living in these areas. So let that be noted. And again, this is something that's in to the part of his book. You could tell who didn't read the book. You could tell. Let's keep going. Between 1350 and 1600, his work was the most widely read book of travel. There are more than 250 surviving manuscripts in German, Dutch, French, English, Latin, Old Irish, Danish, Czech, Spanish, Italian, and other languages. Over three times as many manuscripts of the Mandeville exist as the Odoric or of Marco Polo. As far as the lost tribes were concerned, Mandeville claimed they were found in, the mount, in a mountain Valleys in the distant land beyond Cathay, the Jews of the ten lineages, to be include <laughs> enclosed at Menclep, Men Gulf, and Magoff, and they have they may not go out on no side. There were enclosed toward the high end and toward Bacaria, men passed by the kingdom, the Menclep, Cathay. That is that is a full fair country. Here were twenty two kings with their people that dwelled. Uh, between the mountains of Scythia, the king Alexander chased them between those mountains, and there he thought for to enclose them through work of his men. But when he saw that he might not do it, he prayed to God of nature and, and 
that he would perform that he had begun. Yet God of his grace closed the mountains together so that they dwell there all fast locked and enclosed with high mountains all about, save only on one side, and on the side is the Sea of Caspian. And also you should understand that the Jews had no proper land of their own for to dwell in in all the world, but only that land between the mountains. And yet they yield tribute for that land to the queen of Amazonia. And though it happened that some of them by fortune to go out, they can no manner of language, but Hebrew, so they cannot speak with the people. And yet Nathos men say that they shall go out in the time of Antichrist. And they shall make great slaughter of Christian men. And therefore all the Jews that dwell in the lands Learn always to speak Hebrew and hope that when the other Jews shall go out, they may understand their speech and to lead them into Christendom for to destroy the Christian people. For the Jews say that they know well by their prophecies and that the Christian men shall be under their subjection as long as they have been in subjection of them. So, again, he's covering he's covering all of the mythos that was floating around at that time. And that was one of the stories about the men of Scythia and the mountains of Scythia. It was speculated that it was Israelites there as well. The mouth of the valley system was guarded by the queen of Amazonia. And if it happened that any of them pass out, they can speak no language but Hebrew. They not speak with other men when they come among them. With the coming of the Antichrist, these Jews could be expected to join forces with other Hebrew speaking Jews in other parts of the world and would then overcome the Christian nations, turning them into vassal states. The equation of the lost tribes with the elementally inimical forces of Gog and Magog and groups associated with them, adding something to the fear and hatred with which the Jews were viewed. Travels included both Christians and Jewish myths and legends. The common ground between them is best exemplified in the sections of Preston John's materials. In the 12th century, Ethiopia, or part of it, was thought to be in the east, somewhere in the vicinity of the Caucasus toward India. Gradually, the idea took hold that a Christian kingdom existed stretching from East Africa to the Indus and across Africa as far as the Atlantic Ocean and was ruled over by King Prester John. We, we covered this as well in Eater Bruce's book. It talks about the mythos of this uh, putative king known as Prester John. In 1170, Pope Alexander III had referred to his beloved son, John the Illustrious and Glorious King of India. And for centuries, this figure of the of a saint, a saintly and almost supernatural Christian leader foreshadowing the return of Christ at the end of the days dominated the Western imagination. In the 12th century, a Latin version of the, of the letter written to Manuel, ruler of the Romans, by Prester John started circulating in Western, Af Western Europe. According to this letter, he ruled over the three Indies from the burial place of St. Thomas in the south of the Tower of Babel in the desert of Babylon. 72 kings were subject to him. Among the subjects lived lost 10 tribes, the Amazons and the Pygmies, who were incarcerated behind the Sambat Yon. Through his kingdom flowed one river, one of the rivers of paradise, carrying with it precious stones and golds, and the animals of the rim, including elephants, camels, griffins, and the phoenix. His subjects were free of every vice. They refrained from adultery and theft. They never lied, and the animals did not harm human beings, and no one was poor. So again, he's covering more of the Prester John myth, more of the Pre Prester John legend that was being passed and taught in Europe. And they, they would throw the pygmies in there and throw the lost tribes in there as well. The Hebrew version of the letter notes that the, um, that close to the land of Prester John is a high mountain called Olympus. And underneath the mountain is a spring more important than anywhere in the world. And it is said that it's near the, a paradise, a distance of seven days. And it, there are many precious stones close to the paradise, and they are called diamonds. And also in my country, at its edge, there's a great miracle, a sea of stones with, which make waves as the ordinary seas do. And there is a big wind, and, and it causes a great calamity. And no man is able to pass through the sea. And you may know that from the sea of stones, there is issued a river which comes from a paradise and flows between us and between the great country of the great King Daniel, King of the Jews. And the river flows all days of the week, but on the Sabbath, it does not move from its place until one Sunday, it returns to its strength. And when the river is fully beyond its banks, it carries very many precious stones in the river. There is no water and no one can cross it except on the Sabbath. But we are placing guards at the passages. For if the Jews were oh, able to... Oh, 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 hold up, brother. Hold up, hold up, hold up. You're going too fast. Now, this is powerful because it's saying the Sabbath is what day? 
<laughs> the seven days. Hey, it's a seven day rotation, man. Eddie, I don't, <laughs> hey, look, 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 I'm not in it. We're gonna see what's gonna happen tomorrow. <laughs> Hey, shout out to the source of Bailey. We got a debate tomorrow, you know what I'm saying, between uh, Hebrew sl- the heathen slayer and, and, and Yawasop, and they will be debating the Luna Seven. <laughs> so Right, uh, right. So, uh, yeah, I, I need this screenshot, this screenshot right here, because remember, last week I did, I began a series on, and, and I paused the series because of this debate. Right. 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 So I'm trying to give uh, a reverence to this debate and respect to these brothers who are uh, getting in the ring. But I had started a series on the importance of the Sabbath. So this is going to be a major piece that I'm going to be adding, brother. I just need you to kind of read that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get through this part because this is just basically more mythos that, that was being circulated at the time about um, – King Presta, the Jews in, in, in Africa, and so on and so forth. Uh, we understand that these myths contain some historical reality and value. And what I get the value and historical reality from it is that there were Jews here. You understand? The river flowing and all that other stuff. Okay, that could be fanciful. My whole thing is about the Jews being there. Um, but yeah, it says for the Jews were able to cross, they would it says that no one could cross it on the Sabbath, but we are placing guards at the passages. But if for if the Jews were able to cross, they would cause great damage in, in the whole world against Christians, as well as Ishmaelites and against every nation and tongue under the heaven. But there is no nation or tongue which can stand up to them. There are under the rule of King Daniel, 300 kings, all Jews and all them possesses countries under the power of King Daniel. And also under his governance are 3,000 dukes and counts and great men. And we know that this country is unfathomable. And furthermore, I inform you that in his country, they have many beautiful women and they are ardent and by nature. So the Jewish version or rendition of, of Presser John, they called him King Daniel or called this mythified king, King Daniel, king of the Jews. All right, so reading on, it says, Middle Eastern productions also contributed to the European knowledge about Africa. Until the 16th century, Arab writers such as Abu uh, al-Hassan, Ali ibn al-Hussein, ibn Ali al-Mas'udi from 896 to 956, Abu al-Rahan, Muhammad ibn Ahmad al-Biruni, 973 to 1048, and Muhammad al-Idrisi, from 1099 to 1165 or 1166, knew more about Africa than any European geographer. And there are occasional hints suggesting the presence of Jews in Africa in their works. So these Arabian historians that wrote these things from the, the 9th century to the 12th century were recording actual Jew, Jewish communities in Africa during that time period. And these sentiments and the, their books and their works reverberated in Europe. It says in echoes of this reach Europe for Renaissance Europe and the best known of these Arab historians and geographers was Leo Africanus, 1492 to 1550, who was born mm. of an Arab, who was born of an Arab Muslim parent in Granada and who traveled widely in Africa visiting Timbuktu and the sub-Saharan empires of Barnu and Mali. His most important works was the description of Africa, which was written around 1528 and 1529, and for many years was the essential source on sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. In descriptions, there are frequent mentions of Jews in Africa. He knows significantly that there were warrior tribes in the Atlas claiming descent of King David. This Jewish law had once been widely observed there that the Canaanites traveled to Africa, followed later by the Sabaeans, and that the ruler of Timbuktu disliked the Jews who attended his court, right? It is noteworthy that the echoes of the ideas about the Jews and descriptions is suggesting that the dynastic line of some African royal houses goes back to King David 
or that African legal systems are based on Israelite models still today form an important part of discourse of origin of a number of African societies. Again, Jeremiah, how do you read this book and just not get this part? <laughs> right. Oh, I also want to do this. Let me stop sharing my screen real quick. Jeremiah, speak to the people. I want to grab another book uh, or two departments real quick. Just cover me for a minute, and I'm going to find that real quick. No sweat, man. No sweat. All right, family. So, again, man, we're looking um, and we're examining um, to the Parfus work concerning some of the mythos and some of the actual eyewitness accounts concerning the practices of the people in Africa. How how do you speak and 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 uh, and say the Jews are made up? They're just something that just uh, just and anybody that's in Africa dealing with uh, Judaism is uh, converts. When a multitude of times within this brother's work, he showed a bared witness to these people are connected to Judaism or the Jews themselves based upon descendancy. So my question is, how can they be descended and be a people of color? Oh, well, brother, it was white Jews that 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 uh, that, uh, you know, had sexual relations are amalgamated into these different populations. But yet the population itself or the civilization itself that was developed within the midst of other civilizations. Right such as in areas such as Ethiopia, areas such as Ghana, going back all the way up to Northern Libya, dealing with the people of those areas and regions. We know that these people had migrated there from 70 AD based upon the oppression and slavery that was being dished out by the Romans. So are we supposed to just discredit um, this, this migration pattern? You understand? How do we have certain migrations going northward, some going southward, and now we have um, a variations of different colors of, of Jews? Right. This is something that we have to examine, right, in order to take in consideration. Actually, a brother Joshua, the claim that is being claimed in Africa, really, that claim should be claimed in the north. You understand? When you're talking about conversion. Why don't they never talk about the conversion in Europe? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying to figure out. Right, right. right. You, the well, European we, Jews are just totally accepted. <laughs> but when it comes to you African Negroes, you Negroes was converted. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't get it, bro. Look, man, um, it's been it's been attested before the Europeanization of a lot of these writings that Shem himself was black and pleasant. You understand? Know so if Shem is black and pleasant, I'm going to expect him to produce more black and pleasant people. <laughs> right. Um, but I have the source here on the stream. Uh, excellent and powerful points, brother. This is his latest work, two departments later, latest work, hybrid hate. And he's dealing with the hybridity argument that, okay, these Jews were seen as Negroes, and you have Jews that are white, some are black, so on and so forth. So that's why he named it hybrid hate. Uh, but if you go to page number 90, it says the existence of black Jews in Luongo was another example of the movement from white to black. A remarkable fact, wrote Armistead, <coughs> in, his, in the history of Luongo and the emperor of Congo is that country contains many Jews settled in it. Mm. So thus separate from the African population, they are black and resemble the other Negroes in every respect. He added that he thought it likely that a black Jewish community in Africa, the descendants of a colony of Jews originally from Judea. Damn. 
mentioned without any further detail by the well-known African-American writer and former slave Charles Pennington from 1807 to 1807, where also the community of Jews and Luongo. So this is solidified as historical fact that these black Jews existed in the empire Congo known as Luongo. And it was said that these Jews originally came from Judea. Man, drop a bomb on that, man. Now, gotta get yeah, a man, bomb. Gotta, yeah, man, we got to get a bomb on that one, man. Damn. And Luongo. The black Jews in Luongo. And you know what's heavy about this? <laughs> Charles Pennington yeah. is the first ex-slave to write a book, bro. Mm. And in his, in his book, he mentions these black Jews on the co west coast of Africa coming from Judea. So that's what's the name of his book? What's the name of his book? His book, I, I, I don't know the name of his book off the top of my head, but I didn't quote it a couple times. But if you look up Charles Pennington, he had a uh he was the first person to come with a narrative. Let me do it real quick. Yeah, let's look at it real quick, man. Because we want you, we want you, brothers and sisters, to have these resources, man. Yeah, you can get this get this as a PDF for free online. Yeah, man. Slave. I forget the man, name. Of like it always do. Put in Charles Pennington, in a picture of a white man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the name of this book, real quick? Let's see. Let's see if uh, old wiki, old wiki is reliable. Let's see, big bibliography. Uh, I don't know what the name is. He wrote a narrative though. I, I don't I don't know the name of it. They probably just name it after him. Yeah. <laughs> all right, here we yeah, go. Right. Well, listen, listen, family. Right, here, it is, the origin, here it is the origin and history of colored people. That's what it's called. There you go. Considered the first history of African Americans, he directly challenged published statements by uh, President Thomas Jefferson as the inferiority of black people. Hey man, can you post that in the chat? Yeah, I actually have this PDF. You can actually find this PDF for free online. I actually have it somewhere on my computer. Right hey, yeah, boom! There it is. Everybody got it. Boom! Boom! See that? Here at the source, we're going to give you the source. Okay? That's a okay. fact. Okay? That's a fact. Can my screen be seen? We're going to finish this chapter out. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're good. All right. So last thing we read was, <laughs> it is noteworthy that echoes of the ideas about Jews. It, you can see my screen, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We good. All right. And that <clears throat> echoes of the ideas about Jews of description and description suggesting that the dynastic line of some African royal houses goes back to King David or that African legal systems are based on Israelite models. Still mm. today from an important part of the discourse of the origin of number of African societies. As the major modern source on Africa, descriptions carry great authority in England, along with the translation of Antonio Pigafetta's Pig from 1491 to 1534. Account of the Congo was, was one of the few texts to deal with Africa. In the prologue to his English translation of description, John Pori noted about the fountains of the knowledge. Some say they are there are the people called Kafri or Kafates being black as pitch and of a mighty stature and some man. Hold up, man. I thought this source was uh to discredit the black Hebrew Israelites as they like to call us so disrespectful <laughs> they just so disrespectful man <laughs> right? yeah to the prophet is objective in his research he give you the pros and the cons that's all brothers just look at the cons but there's pros in this book and this is why Garfield got caught lacking the other day. He got smoked, man. R.I.P. Garfield, they read. <laughs> yeah, man. So so I need you to read that last part again 
uh, about the foundations, King David, and the black Jews. About the, the, line, the line of King David? Yeah. All right, so it's noteworthy that echoes of the ideas about Jews in description suggesting that the dynastic line of some African royal houses goes back to King David or that African legal systems are based on Israelite models. Mm. Still today form an important part of the discourse of origin of a number of African societies. Woo! As All right, man. So let me let me say this real quick, man. Um, we 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 got a lot of people watching, man. We we truly truly appreciate your support. We're trying to grow a channel, right? The ch channel that we're trying to grow is the Source Debate League on YouTube, right? Uh, I know you brothers and sisters love Joshu. <laughs> you can see him also at the Source Debate League. We need you to go over there and hit the subscribe button, family. Understand this? We're trying to build that channel up for a reason because uh, they, they have uh, flagged us to death over here, right? So Joshub has a channel, I have a channel, Y'all World 777, I know y'all are watching there as well. You're watching on Genesis 49ers, but this is from what we've built up individually up until we coming together to build up this Source Debate League channel. So we want y'all to go over there and hit the subscribe button Right and hit the notifications so we can get that channel to where we want where we want it to be because eventually we're gonna not be streaming over here no more. You're just gonna get the alerts over here, and we're gonna be streaming everything over there. And it's a reason for that. People come to our channel, they look, see us, uh, 13 people here. Uh, go over here, it's only 17 people watching over here, and they try to cast us off as if nobody's supporting the channel. You understand? But really, it's 45, 55, 65 people watching. You understand? Right. Right? So um, again, that's why we're trying to filter everything through that. This is something that we're building together collectively, right? So we can start doing greater works and presenting greater mm -hmm. things to you, brothers and sisters, because understand this, man, these books, these resources, these things cost money, man, right? So all praise and glory to the most High for what he's doing for us. Well, all we asking you to do, right, is to hit the subscribe button and go to the Source Debate League channel and subscribe over there. All right, Salaki, I didn't mean to take that small commercial break. No, that's all right. If you want more of something, you support it. Right. All right, so we're going we to um, finish this up here. It says, as a major modern source on Africa, description carried a great authority in, in England, along with translations of Antonio Pigafetta's 1491 to 1534 account of Congo, uh -huh. was one of the few texts to deal with Africa. In the prologue of his English translation of description, John Pori noted about the fountains of Nilus. Some say that there are the people called Kafri or Kafatis, being as black as pitch and of a mighty stature and as something descended of the Jew. Mm. Hold but, on, man. This is Tudor Parfit. This is Tudor Parfit. I thought, I thought he was. I thought he was used to destroy the black Jew notion in Africa. <laughs> Not, mean, at Not at all. Not at all. We're going to see as we complete this book. This is just chapter two. We're going to go to chapter three. If you haven't seen part one, it's dealing with the color of the Jews. One of, one of the most powerful and prolific chapters ever written. Uh, go back and watch part one, and I'll probably go to uh, the end of it just to show you, give you a taste of it. But go back and watch part one, see chapter one in the preface and why he wrote this book. It's always important to read the preface and see why these people are reading, writing their books. Because if you just read that, it kills a lot of these notions out there that this is all, oh, this is anti -Israel. No, it's not. All right. So <clears throat> it says, but now they are idolaters and most deadly enemies to the Christians, for they make continuous assaults upon the Abyssines, despoiling them both of life and goods, but all the daytime they lie lurking in mountains, woods, and the deep valleys. These mighty blacks, blacks perhaps descended from Jews and implacable foes of Christians were to feed into the way Europeans viewed Africa. Now, yeah. the, the, the powerful part about this where it says perhaps these are his words. These are Parfit's words. Right. These mighty blacks perhaps descended from Jews. That's his words. 
And implacable foes of Christians were fed, feed into the way Europeans viewed Africa and its inhabitants for several hundred years to come. But in his postscript, Pori identifies some more specifically Jewish African groups. At this day, also the Abyssinians affirm that upon the Nile towards the west, they're inhabited a most populous nation of the Jewish stock under the a mighty king. And some of our modern cosmographers set down a province and those quarters, which they call the land of the Hebrews, placed it as it were under the equinoctial, in certain unknown mountains between the confines of absent Abyssins and the Congo. At the time, virtually nothing was known of Africa and books like descriptions filled the void. It is therefore not surprising that the colonists and missionaries who first encountered the African interior from the 17th century onward drew upon these medieval imaginaire as they tried to make sense of the overwhelming richness, complexity, variety, and sheer strangeness of the African societies. All right. Woo! That's chapter two. The next part, we will be dealing with chapter three, which is going to be dealing with the Hemetic Hypothesis, the Children of Ham, and um, really how the race theory came about. Because the reason why you have racial theories today is because of ideas like the curse of Ham. Well, if you see a black person, then hear all the same from Ham. That's how we think today. All black people are the same. I would yeah, debate man. anybody on that, by the way. Yeah, man. I mean, listen, that uh, chapter two was straight... <laughs> That's, a That's a fact. We read over here, man. We read over here. Now, if I go back to chapter, let me go to one. Hold up, Joshua. That last statement you was making was very powerful. It's like, um, here they are. Here it is. We're rising up to challenge this narrative of race, to challenge this narrative of 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 blackness, to challenge this narrative of being African. We're all the same. Just to come to find out that was a narrative that was pushed by our oppressors. And you got Negroes in 2020 who are going to war to defend that madness. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. They're going right. to war, bro. They're doing little dastardly uh, uh, tactics, right? Such as flagging our channel, right? You understand? Yeah, you know, when we're just simply reviewing information, and the information that we were reviewing was them reviewing us. <laughs> but they right. flagging us. <laughs> man, if this is not the epitome of hypocrisy, man. Because because guess what, family? We're not flagging none of these Negroes. We don't give a damn <laughs> what mm -hmm. these brothers are doing. All the information that they're bringing to the table. We're saying that we want to... We, we don't have no problem with any information that is being presented to be challenged. We are debate league. This is what we do. We have no problem with information being challenged. Everything, everybody at the source is not an Israelite. Everybody at the source don't uh, believe in the Bible. All right. So this is individual information that is being brought forth. So we don't have, we're being challenged every day about this information is my point. Right. So all we're doing is compiling source upon source upon source. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why they call us the source. That's why we got that name. Because right. again, <laughs> we're, we're citing sources over here. Our competitors are not doing that. They're rhetoric masses. They just give us um, their opinion. Okay, but they don't give strong arguments to support their opinion. They don't cite any sources. They don't read these books. We do. We actually take the time out of our day to read these books. And it's so sad for Garfield because Garfield's a stay-at-home mom. He has more time allocated to him than I do. Brothers know I can get real busy in my field of work that I do outside of the YouTube thing. Sometimes I get home as late as 10 o'clock at night. And I still take out the time to read and disseminate information. Why? Because I am committed to this. Those guys don't have a commitment to the information. They don't care about it. You just dismiss it. That's why you don't read about it. Nah, man, it's just a bunch of naysayers, man. You know, hey, did you know that the Jews 
thought there were Jews in Africa. No, it wasn't. And then we just supposed to just drop it. After these Negroes say, no, it wasn't. We just supposed to just drop it and let it go. Because these brothers say, no, it wasn't. <laughs> you Negroes are something else, man. Right, right. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to read um, this from chapter one. I'm not going to read all of it. Go watch the first part. And we covered this. But this is talking about the Jews uh, being seen as black and the notion of the Jews being black. So page 15 says, I'm going to start here for page 14. It says, Portuguese Jewish statesman, exegete and financialer, who observed that once long, once long ago, the Jews had been light-skinned as the Mishnah maintains, but they had grown dark as part of the punishment of the exile. So again, in the Middle Ages, they had what they call melancholia, which was the belief that if you're black, it's because you sinned, right? A lot of these racist ideas about skin color came from the medieval times. And it just evolved into what we call the racial theory. All blacks are Africans. Whites are, your period, uh, are your, uh, European and they're all superior. That came from that period. So when they these Jews looking at themselves as black, they're like, well, damn, we must have did something wrong because these Christians is telling us that <laughs> to be black is sinful. It's a result of sin. But the point of this, this source is the Jews had dark skin. It says the 13th century, century polemical text of Rabbi Yosef ben Nathan, Officio sought to rebuke Christians' charges that Jews were dark and unattractive. Why, the text reads, are the majority of Gentiles white and attractive, while the majority of Jews are black and ugly? Mm. So this was written, I believe, in the 13th century. Right. It says the writer explains this through an analogy of ripening fruit. Plums and sloes, he argued, are white at the start and become dark when they are ripe. Whereas fruits like apples or apricots, which are red at the start, would finish up white and shriveled. This is seen as a meaning that the Jews who have no contact with the red or menstrual blood at the moment of their conception. Because we know, according to um, the laws of Moses, you cannot sleep with a woman while she's on her ministration. But he's saying, as Jews, we refrain from that. That's why we're black. So he's giving an a, um, esoteric reason why they're black. And he's saying, but you Gentiles, y'all don't restrain from that. And that's why you're white. So he was kind of flipping the stereotype back on them. It says, as Jews refrain from sexual intercourse during the menstrual period, we'll finish up black. Whereas Christians who do not avoid the red a menstrual blood during sexual intercourse will finish up white like apples. The same thought is expressed in the contemporary Safir Yosef Hapmakana. So the point I want to bring out is the Jews were seen as all black and ugly during the 13th century in this period in this area, right? So why would they be having a discourse about this if they're not? Okay, so Safir Yosef Hapmakana, which boasts that we Jews are from a clean and white seed, therefore our faces are black. That's what it says. Mm. But you are from a red seed administration. Therefore, your visages are pale and red. Right. All right. And that, and that goes to uh, why many of us come to the conclusion that Esau was describing what we would call today a Caucasian or white male. Uh, the idea that Jews were blacks persisted into the 19th century. Robert Knox, 1791 to 1862, the controversial surgeon and anatomist and conservator of the College Museum, Edinburgh, in the mid-19th century, commented on the African character of the Jew, his muzzle-shaped mouth and face removing him from other races. The general look of a Jew was considered to be like that of the black. Mm. The general look of the Jew was considered like that of the black. Whose words are these? Parfits. The contour. <laughs> <laughs> the contour is convex. The eyes long and fine. The outer angles running toward the temples. The brow and nose apt to form a single convex line. And the whole physiognomy. When swarthy, as it often is, has an African look. What does swarthy mean? Dark. Woo! 
19th, 19th century physical anthropology. Hey, hey Josh, you, man, you gotta you gotta get out of these white people, man. <laughs> Leave Benny alone. <laughs> <laughs> yo, 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 listen, family. Um, this is in that man's same book, the same man that got interviewed the other day. Right, right. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, Joshua, why wasn't this particular portion talked about at all? Well, one, you have to actually read the book to even know what's in there. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, Garfield wouldn't even, if he, if he did know about it, he wouldn't ask him that because he's trying to paint a narrative. You know what I'm saying? That, you know, all you Negroes that say y'all Jews is lying. Y'all fake. <laughs> so that's his purpose. His purpose is not to uh, bring out truth and bring out, you know, get understanding of what's being written here. All right, so um, 19th century physical anthropologists in general assumed that Jews had a close racial, that is, blood connection with blacks. The general consensus of the ethnological literature of the late 19th century was that the Jews were black or at least swarthy. One such explained the predominant mouth of some Jews being a result of the presence of black blood. And now, when they say when they say predominant mouth, they just simply mean they're just speaking on thick the thickness of the lips, correct? Yes, you got the Jay Z, the Jay Z syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> the Rock Boys right. build the night, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right. Now, listen, man. Sometimes we have to um, magnify some of these points, family, so you can get a clearer picture that is being made. Right. You know, because. Again, this is all for your benefit when you're entering into these conversations. Matter of fact, I would encourage you all right now to screenshot this. Let me go ahead and move this out the way. Screenshot this because this is a kill shot right here. This whole passage right here is a kill shot. Right. So I would encourage everybody to go ahead and screenshot this right here. One second here, because I'm doing it right now. Right, hold up. Seems like I ain't caught up there. Okay, here we go. Yeah, let me go ahead and get this. Boom. All right, man, let's go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gotta say that, but it's um, Yeah, so it says, the predominant of some, the predominant mouth of some Jews being a result of the presence of black blood in that brown skin, thick lips, and pronosticism were typical of Jews. Brown skin, brown skin. I got brown skin. Jeremiah got brown skin. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, man. If, if you look up Jews right now on, on Google, uh, it, it tell me does it fit that description that we just read? Hold on. Right, right, right. Because the first thing I'm thinking about is Max Kellerman. Max Kellerman claimed to be a Jew, right? <laughs> I don't think Max Kellerman has brown skin, family. <laughs> is it talking about these? <laughs> <laughs> right. When you look at these people, does it just scream swarthy? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> these niggas, these oh, excuse me, these people with these two curls hanging out the side of their head. It, what we just read, does it fit these people right here? Are they brown? Leave Benny alone. Please. <laughs> now that that's not to say that you can have real Jews look like this. That's not my point. My point right. is that the existence and prevalence of black Jews it, it, it's it's clear that 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 they existed. There's no way around it, and they were describing these people as such. But when people when we read this stuff, some of you guys are envisioning in your mind these people here. 
I don't know how, how these people don't have no pig. They got little pigmentation, but they don't have, uh, they're not heavily melanated to be considered brown. The hell wrong with y'all. All right, let's get back into the book, man. <laughs> All right. So it says, and that brown skin, thick lips and prognosticism were typical of the Jews. One of the key physical indicators of race was the nose for the encyclopedia. All deviant noses were put together. The blacks, the hot and tops, and various people of Asia, such as all Jews. And a sense of appearance of Jews and blacks was constructed in a similar, similar way, simply because both Jews and blacks were pariahs and outsiders. And in the racialized mind of Europe, this shared status implied that Jews and blacks had a shared look. Mm. And shared black color in a shared black color. Let me go back to here. Let me go back over here. Now, where do you see these people being black at? Right. Come on, man. Stop playing. Stop playing. Y'all, you guys is playing, man. Let me look up Max Kellerman, the damn ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> this is... <laughs> <laughs> Yo, <laughs> yo, and in an in in exact shared blackness. <laughs> Leave Benny alone. Yeah. You know, <laughs> when I read this, they had a shared look and a shared black color. I don't think of this. Right. I don't. I don't think of Max Kellerman. You know what I'm saying? I don't think of Charleston Heston. I don't think of these people. But for some reason, when we're reading about Jews and we're reading about this time period and how they describe, you get these pseudos that think about people like this. They think about uh, Hasidic Jews, Ashkenazis. No, no, that's not what we're reading, man. And that's why... Hey, you know, you know what's funny, man? Um, when that thing happened with Nick Cannon, they covered it on on his show with with uh with uh, uh Stephen A. Mm -hmm. they, they covered what Nick Cannon said, and you know it was like he was offended. <laughs> I, mean, I, you know, I mean, listen, man, uh, should you be upset with two par for Max Kellerman? <laughs> <laughs> because we didn't write this book, right? We didn't write it. And history, we're not responsible for. What we're saying is, is all praises to the most high God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that to the proper had the testicular fortitudes to tell the truth, man. Jews and blacks had a shared look and a shared black color. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Facts and, it's, and it goes on In some cases Jews were considered black Because they were of mixed African Judaic race mm. On occasion The blackness or darkness of the skin Of the African like the Jew were, Was perceived as being Not only due to inheritance but also Due to, due to the effect Of diseases such as syphilis so that's what what else was being taught in medieval times that well, if you're black, it's because you got some kind of sickness or disease. And we already know either Bruder cut that to the core. It's right. like if, if, if you want to look at anything as a sickness or disease, like leprosy, that's dealing with paleness. That's dealing with whiteness. There's right. no nothing in the Bible that says that, oh, you're going to get sick and grow black. You understand? <laughs> right. So, yeah, man. Um Powerful book, powerful, powerful book. I want before we close to actually go to Sister E's channel and let to the parchment give a powerful statement that he brought over there that's on Sister E's channel. And um, let me stop sharing my screen and and um let him let him just tell the people for himself. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, right, right there. We have the fair you. <laughs> Under the Fair Use Act, we can review, comment, add parody, um, use it for scholarship and research purposes. 
So we're well within our right under the Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976. You understand? For all you haters out there that want to see us fall, right. at the end of the day, we're going to stand tall. You heard me? <laughs> right. Let me pull Talk up. Talk to me nice. Shout out to the firehouse, man. Talk to me nice. Yeah, man. You know, and I appreciate Sister E for even getting this interview, man. Y'all go subscribe to Sister E. Yeah, man. Uh, let me go to let me go to her video. Let me see where is it at. Ah, right here. Could carry the Nagoma. Can I sit on the subject? Of You're not the, sharing that. Oh my bad. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get the time marker. Yeah, no sweat, no sweat. Yeah, Here man, while the brother's trying to get that, man, um, again, man, we got um, a debate, man, tomorrow night, man. St stay tuned in with the source, man. You understand me? 2011, we wanted our jobs back. 2021, we working. Understand that, man. Understand that. That's a fact. now we working. All right, let's let Tar to the Parfix speak for himself, man. I was like the Jews in Luango. That that was one of one of the uh, the areas that we we did a preliminary study on, um, and we, we did we were able to dig up some some references on that where uh, where it's. Uh, I do have a slight critique here on, on this interview. I love y'all, but y'all get somebody like two department on y'all channel again. Let that man talk for the whole duration of the. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They go ahead. Hey man, I, I can't stand with Dick Rose. You know, I'm not saying this is what was going on on this show, but I can't stand when I Nick Rose come on and try to prove what they know. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, man, come on, brother. We we heard you. We've been listening to you, bro. Right. Right. <laughs> man, we would have got two apart from here. I was like, man, it's your show. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Go on here and rock out. You know what I'm saying? And uh, at the end, we'll give our little two cent tw questions or whatever. Right spoke about the Jews of Luango and there was some supposition as far as you know where they where they came from I believe one of one of the uh, the people on site that actually interacted with them you know said that they spoke perfect Portuguese and they were um, just going off the top of my head that they were um, uh, well 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 they, they, they understood the Portuguese history very well I think this, this is how he, I'm paraphrasing it well I don't I don't know about that reference and um, I'd be very surprised if it were entirely true I think they would have known a bit of European languages, because after all, they traded. Um, but in none of my sources do I get that. And I, 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 I believe that they are descended from the orphans who were exiled, the Jewish orphans, the Spanish Jewish orphans who were exiled to the Portuguese possession of uh, San Tomé, San Tomé. But there's no absolute proof of that. Um, it's probable. Uh, but you're absolutely right that there were plenty of other uh, settlements, um, particularly in Senegal and down the um, what's called Le Petite Côte. And there are a couple of um, very good uh, books on the subject of uh, this uh, Sephardi settlement in the West Africa. We know, for instance, that by the middle of the 16th century, so 1550-ish, uh, there were a number of uh, communities that by then were black. They, they intermarried, and um, but they maintained Judaism, and that's in Senegal. And uh, undoubtedly, there were others further south, and we have references to these black Jews going way down the coast of West Africa. So the people that um, say you know, there aren't, there just aren't any. Jews in, uh, in Black Africa, or there's no proof of it, are simply wrong. You're wrong. You're simply wrong. If you're saying in 2021 that there are no Black Jews in West Africa, there were no Black Jews in West Africa, you are lying to the people. Facts. And to the prophet, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> there is that. And, you know, the, um, 
the various kind of um, the theories that um, emerge from uh, kind of Jewish groups in uh, Nigeria, among the Igbo, and uh, and in let's say Ghana, uh, with the community there, and uh, different places uh, throughout Africa. Um, you know, it's. Um, I, I mean, in a way, they're kind of theoretical. I'm not casting doubt on them because these. Look, he says, hey, these, these testimonies from these tribes are theoretical in a way, but he's not casting doubt upon them. So why are you guys trying to use this man's work to cast doubt on black Jews? The Jews of Ghana, the Jews of Igbo, Igbo land, right? You try to use this man's work or try to say that he's saying that, and he's telling you verbatim, I'm not doing that. These are people's cherished beliefs and you know one shouldn't cast out upon people's um, uh, cherished belief i mean one of the things that we all that many people in in this country uh, hold sacred is uh, the stories like the virgin birth well there's no it was difficult to prove that there was a virgin birth but it would be a uh, very bad form and very gentlemanly to go around and say <laughs> virgin birth nonsense and that's what people do, you know, with respect to uh, to uh, right. origin stories. Or you know, every nation has got its origin stories, and they may or may right, right. So you just cast it away, and y'all acting as if to the prophet is doing. He ain't telling you, no, I'm not doing that. Right. It may not be historically true, but usually it's impossible to know. So. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, and that's what I tell y'all. Unless you got a time machine, and you can go back in time and observe everything, everybody... Okay, this brother went over here. He had children over here. Okay, yeah, now okay, now I can say whether or not it's true. You don't have no damn time machine, man. So we doing what we can, uh, uh, having an analysis of the, the information and drawing a conclusion from there through abductive reasoning. That's how we do it. That's why he said it's impossible to know. You can't, unless you got on a damn time machine from back in the future, you could drive that damn car into uh, 2000 BCE or 1000 BCE. You can't do that, man. So you have to, this is the best way we can do it, the historical method. But there's plenty of evidence anyway of, uh, of these settlements. We also know that in the... Um you know, from the 17th century on, the, the whole of the Sahara is full of black Jews. You heard what he just said? The whole of the Sahara from the 17th century on, we know that the whole of Sahara is full of black Jews. That's to the prophet's words. There's no question about that. It's There's no question about it. So why do we got these idiots on YouTube questioning it? No, I said you guys are scenics, man. You guys are scenics, and it shows. Absolutely, it's it's there in black and white, and um, you know there there are references to how they look, and they they're not Arab looking; they're uh, black African looking. They're not Arab looking; they're black African looking. No, hold on, man. Right, right. right. Yeah, bring it out, man. Damn, he's spitting hot fire right now. Let's go. <laughs> Things that we all, that many people in, in this country uh, hold sacred as uh, the stories like the virgin birth. Well, there's no, it was difficult to prove that there was a virgin birth, but it would be a uh, very bad form and very gentlemanly to go around and say, virgin birth, nonsense. And that's what people do, you know, with respect to, uh, to uh, you know, kind of origin stories or, you know, Every nation has got its origin stories, and they may or may not be historically true, but usually it's impossible to know. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, there's, there's plenty of evidence anyway of uh, of these settlements. We also know that in the, um, you know, from the 17th century on, that the whole of the Sahara is full of black Jews. There's no question about that. It's absolutely, it's, it's there in black and white. And... Um, you know, there, there are references to how they look. And they're, they're not Arab looking, they're uh, black African looking. 
and uh, they're celebrating Judaism. And uh, uh, so that's the Sahara. That would be uh, uh, places like Mali and places like um, Chad and places like um, the Sudan, no doubt. So, mm. you know, the historical fact. So again, he's showing you historical merit to the claims that these that the whole of Sahara was full of black Jews. They didn't look like Arabs. These were black African Jews. So I mean, what else do you want? Like, <laughs> hey, what what Tyree say? What more do you want from me? <laughs> right. Yeah, man. Hey, I mean, uh, listen, family. They are literally trying to use this guy. Because he does not speak in absolutes, right? It doesn't say all of these people are Jews or all of these people in Ghana are Jews. All these people, he's not doing that. So they're trying to play on that. They're trying to play on that, right? But one thing he does say is that the Jews are not Arab looking. They're not Arab looking. They look African. And that's a kill shot. Facts. Facts. Fact of um, black Jews in Africa is well attested. Let me go we back. Do, you know, with Let's respect do. to we got to we got to run that back, man. But to uh, you know, kind of origin stories, or you know, every nation has got its origin stories, and they may or may not be <coughs> historically true, but usually it's impossible to know. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, there's, there's plenty of evidence anyway of uh, of these settlements. We also know that in the, um, you know, from the 17th century on, that the whole of the Sahara is full of black Jews. There's no question about that. He said full of black Jews. And there's no question about it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is a man that got his PhD studying this. This is a man that's been studying this and teaching this for the past what? since the 80s so we're talking about what 40 years come on not only that this is a man that has actually traveled and been there exactly that said amongst the limbo that try that he physically traveled their migration route that they taught in their oral history so he can understand where they were coming from you understand this man did all of that so I'm going to take his word over some internet troll that makes makes a living off being a scenic. And a scenic just means someone that's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Vehemently, uh, neg uh, habitually negative towards everything. Oh, that's fake. This fake. This is fake. You understand? That's what a scenic does. Don't consider no histor no historicity. Don't, 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 don't consider the source. Don't do nothing. Yeah. And shout, out to, uh, shout out to um, uh, Brother Yawasai from Connecticut. Right, the brother. When me and the brother was on the uh, on on the godless hour, and it was definitely the godless hour. Right, <laughs> and he asked those brothers, "Are you saying that you deny history and archaeology?" And them brothers said, "Yes." <laughs> so everything that brother Joshu just said, these brothers exist, and they're on your they're on your YouTube every day. Right. Yeah, man, they scenics, man. C Y N I C. They're scenics. You understand? These people, these people are habitually negative towards these views. And it has nothing to do with the historicity or can we prove it? It's just that they're against it. That's it. It's there. A skeptic is someone that's like, well, I doubt it because X, Y, and Z. A scenic is just they just doubt it. Or are they just against it just because? It's absolutely, it's, it's there in black and white. And, um, you know, there, there are references to how they look. And they're, they're not Arab looking, they're uh, black African looking. And mm. uh, they're creating Judaism. And, uh, uh, so that's the Sahara. That would be uh, uh, places like Mali and places like. Um, Chad and places like um, the Sudan, no doubt. So, you know, the historical fact of um, black Jews in Africa is well attested. 
the historical fact of black Jews in Africa are is well attested. Well attested. Come on, man. There's nothing you guys can do against this. In, in Africa as well as so in, in Africa, in addition to Africa, what about have you have you have you I think in your book, um and actually I was trying to pull it up when Sister E when you came to me the first all time. Right, I, been, I, I, was, I ain't been I ain't been I we got what we need now. Hey, hey, um, how should we close the show out? You know what I'm saying? Hey, uh, blessings, man. All right, let me back on the sister that we started the show with. You got right. that? You need me to send it to you. I think I think it's I think it's still in my uh should be there in my inbox somewhere somewhere in there. But uh, I hope everybody watching got something from from this man. We will be completing his book. The next part is going to be chapter three. There's nine chapters in total, so there should be a nine part series that's going to be archived on the channel. I'm going to create a playlist so. Uh, you guys can just go to the playlist and watch it in its entirety once it's completed. Um, yeah, man, great we're show. Gonna that, we're going to do that for every book series that we do on here. We know that since we work so much here at The Source, a lot of information can get lost in in, uh, in, in the YouTube uh, black hole, so to speak. So we're going to we're going to compile this information and we're going to have that available for anybody that wants to wants to get that man so uh be on the lookout for that man put a nice package around it i'm gonna go do some editing work man and insert you would we'll be able to do a lot more with that you know without the restrictions of youtube man so it's gonna be powerful yeah man because they're coming after you know what i'm saying <clears throat> well it's fine we're gonna keep we're gonna, we gonna stand tall on this information yeah uh, man because it's this brother has uh, um, other lectures and other uh, uh, speakings that he's done that will further substantiate uh, the book itself, man. So, yeah, Josh, I'm going to be getting with you, man, so we can put that together for the people so they have that, man, and be able to sit down and, and uh, utilize that as a teaching tool. Yeah, man. All right. I'm looking for it now. It wasn't in the inbox. I thought it was there. But I guarantee nope. you if I go to your channel, if I go to Y'all World and I type in blessings, it's going to come up. I, I guarantee you that's how it's... I, 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 I'm sure it's on your channel, right? Yeah. Oh, come on, man. Uh, man, hold up. I got it for you right quick. Yeah, give uh -huh. me the YouTube. It's better if you give me the YouTube. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, man. So uh, we working over here, man. Like 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 the brother said, we're gonna finish Eda Brutus' book. Um, it just takes more time to do that one because I'm actually typing in PowerPoint slides so you guys can see it because I had a physical copy of the actual book, and so you guys can actually see what's actually in the book. Um, I'm trying to be as transparent as we can here on the source but part four we're, we're going to conclude that and that'll be the we'll finish that actual book and uh we'll have it as a playlist saved on youtube so you guys can access the information um and watch it in its entirety whenever you guys are free to do so so like like the brother said man we we work and we building over here and uh ain't no stopping this man ain't no stopping this we proven to y'all who really is dedicated, who's really into the information. These other brothers are dilettantes. Dilettantes mean they're not committed and they don't have enough. You understand? So they'll forever be stamped as such. Shout out to the to the chat. Shout out to everybody that came out tonight and showed us uh, love. Shout out to Truthfully Honest, you on every show. We appreciate it. Shout out to uh, Elder Yurash. Shabbat Shalom, brother. Congratulations on your win. You pretty much slaughtered. Um, um, never stood a chance, to be honest. <laughs> Orthodox Moore, D Red, Blue, the Blue Collar Scholar, shout out, brother. And uh Plumantis, man. Shout out, brother. 
Shalom. Shabbat Shalom to you, brother, man. You always showing love. We're going to show love. You always got a place you want to come on and speak. You always, got, you always got the mic, brother. Trust me. You are not going unnoticed. Ah, we got a channel called The Seven Candlesticks. Seven Gang. Oh, yeah, he's right. We should set up a Patreon for the source. He's right. We set a Patreon up for, for an uh, account. Yeah, man. But here's the thing. We set a Patreon up. You guys going to have to subscribe to that thing, man. I mean, you got to pay. Right. You have to pledge, or I forget how it is, like a five dollar pledge or something like that to even keep that going. That's a great idea. Look, man, we're trying to implement all of these things to you know help grow the channel. Shalom to Akmalak. Uh Yashar. Tanks on the ground in the building. Shalom, brother. That's that's one of the founding fathers of the of course, right there, man. Uh Amanda. Amanda said Hitler was hunting down the scientists of the Sumerian Shem Sumer to forcefully make them do what he wanted them to do for him and the Nazis. You falsely, falsely so-called blacks won't even. You falsely so-called blacks won't even consider that it was you, you men who separated from the other brother of the Israelites. Your life because you had too much stubborn testosterone causing us the desire to compete against your brother instead of working together toward common goals. You all put women and children in danger when you forget that there are strength in numbers of brethren. You still want to blame everything on TV. He, human, woman, you are a bunch of bullies competing again. What is, I don't understand what this is talking about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she went all the way in. I mean, I don't know. She did three paragraphs. Right here she says, the Ethiopians were first to write about Ether. What well, you trying to say, Esther? Thus, thus, that's why the Greek state started to call the Nubians as Ethiopians. Oh, okay. Oh, I know that you stubborn or falsely identify yourselves as being a derogatory term as black men don't like to learn from any women. I don't, uh, I don't. Sister, you're welcome to come on the show at any time to express your opinions and views. And maybe it's more clear if you got on here and told us what you meant by that. I don't want to speculate. Right. Uh, shout out to Gadawar Gabar, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, the brother was talking about uh, that Blair Nows book actually goes back to 1919. So, yeah, it would be 101 years old. Shout out to, I guess, Reg83NY. Uh, truthfully honest, like I said, Shalom, sister. We see you. We see you. Uh, Gary Curtis. Shalom, brother. Shalom. Thanks for the support. Hit that like button. Uh, shalom to uh, Yaakim Javelin. Shalom to David Yisrael. Yeah, he, he he said he said the seven day cycle is off your mind. He said it is uh, the seven day should be Wednesday. <laughs> mm. well, listen, man. Uh, we are a debate league, brother. We're gonna have a debate uh, tomorrow on that. And uh, if you want to come in and think you can do a better job, if the results ain't what you like, you're more than welcome to come on and uh, bring forth your information, brother. Yeah, yeah, that's big facts. Yeah, me, me, me personally, I, I hold to a seven day weekly schedule, man. I mean, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's it, man. <laughs> right, right. I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm right there with you. I ain't the part of it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe tomorrow my, my mind will be changed. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, but, but again, we're open, man. We're not, uh, what you call them, brother? Scenic. Okay. Yeah, man. We we ain't scenics, man. We we here to learn. Um man, Amanda was going in. Whoever this chicken tell her <laughs> to come on and she can express her opinions on the source. We'll give her the panel and give her 30 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour to express her opinions and then, and then we're gonna have questions for you. <laughs> right. Uh, says Romanians were invaded by Harsh Vatican II. Was there was no letter J for even six hundred years yet, so no one was called Jews two thousand years ago. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to speak to that real quick. Uh, modern translations, man, they're not going to be exactly what was spoken. 
two thousand years ago, because two thousand years ago nobody was speaking English. Nobody right. was speaking, you know, how we the languages we speak right now. They were speaking Greek, Roman, and not all Greek and, 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 and uh Italian or whatever. Not all of those languages are the same. I mean Latin. You got different dialects of that. So of course they wasn't saying it, but for us to understand and we have our our names and what we what we call them in our tongue. You see what I'm saying? Like, right. Uh, well, listen, we're just speaking colloquially. Uh, Paul tells us in the New Testament not to make ourselves barbarian, right? By speaking in an unknown tongue. <laughs> okay. So if we come on here and we're spitting out Hebrew unto y'all, man, y'all not gonna get it, man. Y'all not gonna get it, right? So it's it's more important that you understand what we're referencing, right? So for someone to point out the letter J, like we understand that, we understand that, and I'm with you, right? We say Kwam Yashala, right? We say we say power to our people. For folks to understand that. We, they have to know that, listen, we're talking about rise Israel when we say Kwame Yashal. You see? So these things, are, we know that the language goes back, but we want what is most important, which is for the people to understand on the basis level. This is what Paul was saying. Paul said, I'd much rather speak with five words of understanding than a multitude of words in an unknown tongue. First Corinthians chapter 14, man. Right? So um, we're simplifying here and we're doing that purposely so everyone can comprehend. It's very important that that happens. This is why we elaborate on certain words and terms, scholastic words and terms that are being used. It's important that you understand what these terms mean. So when your words are being used here at the source, we break those words down. Right? Yeah, man. But again, yeah, you're more than welcome to come on on here if you want to express something, sister. <laughs> <laughs> See, she got a lot yeah. to say, boy. I mean, straight yeah. curve. I don't even know you can get that many words in the comment section, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Facebook don't got no limit, man. Uh, YouTube, no limit. Look, she, she right here again. Uh, she said they were called Berbers, Ebers, and Ebos. Let me get on the stream. The good Samaritans, the Semitic people. Yeah, man. Your sister could get a snot on the show. And, uh, <laughs> speak of mine. Uh, so know, I, I got that uh that, that the video is uh it was actually on Army of Israel. So I sent it to you in the in the uh, DM. All right, all right. Uh Ramal Yahoo, Shalom, uh Sharai Atkins, Shalom. Appreciate that new subscriber to the channel. Uh, Maria Yashaya. Yes. Dang, this sister went in again? She said, you men still have to admit how most states and places are named after women. As Africa is named after Aphrodite, even a Moorish tribe with a fork. Now you have Africa that's a Caucasian. Oh, uh, what the, does that have to do <laughs> with what we're talking about, man? <laughs> Come on, man. Oh, um, you. Go, uh, is she is she is certain that we're we're somehow leaving the woman out? I don't I don't get it. Yeah, yeah, you know, because you know Hebrews are all a bunch of women hating uh, sexes. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, but yet one of the founders of the source is a woman, man. Shout out to the to, shout out to Sister Diamond, man. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah, shout out to Sister Diamond. Uh, we were just talking to her. She pulled a jewel out. You know, I don't want to spill the bean. You know what I'm hey, saying? man, look, I'm gonna tell you, man. That sister's not to be played with, man. And, and Deron Tillis, if you listening, brother, let me tell you <laughs> something, brother. All right, you can go ahead and, and underestimate this sister if you want to, brother. All right, my money's on Diamond. Understand that. Right, but go ahead, bro. <laughs> hey, I also want to speak to this. Uh, if you go to the book of Jubilees, I believe it's the book of Jubilees, it talks about 
they named the lands after their daughters. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, no, nah, ain't nobody sitting up here denying that that ever happened. I don't know why you even said that, but maybe, like, again, if you're still watching uh, Amanda's sister, you can have your own show here on The Source. We'll give you the panel. You can go in for 30 minutes to an hour, and, you know, after your hour's done, we're going to have a Q&A. You can express your opinions and let us know where you come from. We're going to have a Q&A, and we're going to have some questions for you. Um, she said it's the opposite. The so-called whites who are really Caucasian lost their melanin by doing incest within their generations like Nimrod did. Now, with that, I will agree that um, the Europeans are mostly inbred people. Notorious, that, notoriously inbred. Yeah, yeah. And that is how they lost a lot of their genetic. Um, yo, yo, Joshua, I told a brother that. Man, I think I, shout out to Black Jesus Minister, man. <laughs> I think I told that brother that man. Uh, well, 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 well. How would they? How would they? And I said, listen, man. They was isolated in Mount Seir. First of all, it was isolated in Mount Seir, and then a thousand plus years later, or more, fifteen hundred years later, they was isolated in the Caucasus Mountains, right? Uh, notoriously in, inbred tells you that Esau. There's no greater fornicator than in Esau. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, man. That's how they, um, had limited genetic diversity. A lot of them are white, pale skin, and have a lot of these recessive traits. Uh, Shalom to Moray, Yeshaya, Torah lessons. Shalom to you, brother. Shalom to Sir Lot. Shalom. Hit that like button, brother. Shabbat Shalom. Scott Garant Haley. Shalom to you. Dang, this sister went in again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yo, she said yo, after yo, <laughs> yo, man, we might gotta drop the link. Let her come on on, man, because she <laughs> and she got something she want to say, man. <laughs> she said after getting invaded and our temples taken away, we had to start over again and start to call ourselves Jews from being Shemites, Semites. Uh, a good Sumerian. She also says Asians, real or, original Aboriginal Irish, Amer Armenians, Romanians, who were all people of color, mostly with curly wavy hair and brown to yellow to tan skin. So she had her own little lesson going on back here. She was teaching while we were teaching. Yeah, man. <laughs> listen, man, we, uh, I mean, listen, you want to come on real quick, man? We keep about 15 minutes, man. But then we're going to have to have some questions. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Sean Harris. He be on Thank every show. You know, show in love. You know what I'm saying? Shalom, brother. Shalom, brother. Shabbat shalom. Uh, you dropped that link for real. <laughs> Yeah, man. I mean, listen to it. It's in, it's, it's, in, it's in the chat, man, if you got something you want to say, because, I mean, I think uh, YouTube give you uh, 140 characters, man. <laughs> you, you, you're you exceeding that, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> man, sister's not going to come out here right now, man. But, uh, sister, if you hear us, just hit us up on the Facebook group. And we can set up a schedule date where you can come on, express your opinions, and get, do your own show. You'll, we'll let you pick a title. You know what I'm saying? As long as it's not nothing vulgar, nothing you know, crazy, you're good. And uh, we'll go from there. Again, Facebook group, Short Debate League, and leave a comment. A lot of y'all joining the Facebook group and not leaving a comment and telling us what you want. You need to come in there and tell us, hey, I want to be a judge, I want to be a debater, or I want to present information on the platform. Right. And we'll, we will allow it. We will allow it. You know what I'm saying? It's an open platform. We'll let anybody come on here and speak. The Ron's been on here. Uh, we had Matt this week. <laughs> Shout out to Matt So Real. We had Matt So Real this week. He came out and gave a lesson. You know what I'm saying? And we don't agree with Matt. We don't agree with, with his modern Christian theology. <laughs> <laughs> But we allowed him to have a voice. This is what sets this platform apart from other platforms because you're not going to find it nowhere else. You're not. You know, these other platforms, you go on there with, with an opposing idea, it's going to be eight people there waiting to kill you, man. 
You get one sentence out, they wait, they waiting to, you know what I'm saying? Gish gallop you to death. Right. You know what I'm saying? Shalom the um second exodus, Shabbat Shalom. And Shalom the Royal Prince, man. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, source debate league on YouTube, follow us on the Facebook group on YouTube on uh, Facebook, source debate league on Facebook. Leave a comment saying you want to be a debater or a judge or you want to present information. Leave a comment. There's no way else we can tell that you want to do something if you don't communicate. <laughs> All right. All right. That's, uh, let's open this YouTube up. I don't know why I couldn't find it. I thought you sent this to me greetings, before. Greetings, greetings to you all. S-U-C. Y'all know how we do. Source up, gang. We Gold Coast again. Gorillas, man. Yeah, man. Gold Coast Gorillas. Shout out to King Self. Middleweight champion, put some respect on his name, man. Yeah, yeah, man. Middleweight champion, man, but I've been doing damage. All right, let's get to it. I've been sent here to do great things, amazing things, beautiful things, positive things, blessing things, healing things, happy things, happy things, for the rebuilding of the new world, the blessing of the world. To build the kingdom here of the Most High God here on earth. Blessings to you. Sending you love and positive vibrations around the world. Blessings to you. Welcome. Most motivation to start with devastation. You must fall before you rise. They want a demonstration. I'm here to get it all right before I spend it all. The elderly to come and see the you. They need to get involved. I want the finer things in love with shiny things. Descended from black royalty, so you can blame my veins. I just call it blessings. I got the right perspective. If I see myself going off, I'm just gonna change direction. I love the brotherhood with all the flaws of brotherhood. I ain't gotta say a damn word and know it's understood. Yeah, we make mistakes, but that's what makes us great. Learn how to accept apology without acting fake. I know the pot is hot. Because you grudge bearing yes, A yes, lot of yes. niggas going blind because they sun is staring They on the mission to dim the light We call it tail bearing The law said thou should not covet But he's still staring And now I'm mortified with all the sins that multiply Got your brother crying at the wall Like a Mordecai I'm really horrified A lot of brothers are feminized They really start to bug my damn nerves I use pesticide I'm one reward and a Get your blessings from the most high. Matthew 7 7, seeking a shall find. If you like it, show me open wide. Blessings. Hey, get your blessings. Hey. Deuteronomy 28 2 and 3. All these blessings shall come upon thee. All these blessings shall overtake thee. Get your blessings, hearken unto thee. Bless. Shall thou be in the field, bless? Shall thou be in the city? I push a Range Rover until the rain's over. Dying from an overdose, I hate that he can't stay sober. But it's not the car, it's my spirit, man. Claiming that he's your brotherly love, but he never does. There's no greater wealth than your family's health. Gather all the negativity and put it on the shelf. And it's nothing wrong. When you have success, a father leave inheritance to his children, that man is blessed. Unlearn, relearn, and apply. Get your blessings from the most high. Matthew 7, 7, seek and we shall find. If you like it, show me open wide blessings. Ay, get your blessings. Ay. Deuteronomy 28, 2 and 3. All these blessings shall come upon thee. All these blessings shall overtake thee. Get your blessings, hearken unto thee. Bless. Shall thou be in the field? Bless. Shall thou be in the city? Yo, Shalom, Shalom. Bob Shalom family, we appreciate the love and support, man, here at the source, man. Stick with us. More and more powerful information to come. We appreciate it, man. Y'all go check out and support the sister, man. 
as always, man, SUC, seven game, right? This is what we do, man. Source up or shut up, man. It's not a debate. It's a stick up, man. Gang. <laughs>